Well, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I mean, to be here in this great building. Uh, I've been teaching American history for almost 25 years now, and my experience is that the students I've taught from Boston are the most historically conscious of them all. I think there are very good reasons for that, and I think places like this, historic places like this, are certainly one major reason. Uh, it's also good to be in the city of my wonderful publisher, Beacon Press. I think Bostonians should be proud of Beacon Press. I know that uh, I am delighted to be an author of Beacon Press. This is the second book that I've published, and uh, my editor, Guy Tripatnaik, is here, and I'd like to acknowledge her help, everything that she did with this book, right off the bat. Well, I know why you're here. You're here because you love pirates. So I'm going to get right down to it. And I'm going to tell a pirate story that took place here in Boston. I should also say, it's wonderful to be in a place with a seafaring tradition. You know, I live in Pittsburgh. You know, I mean, the Ohio River is grand, but not quite the same. Okay, so let me read a little bit. I'm going to describe an encounter between a pirate named William Fly. I would imagine most of you have never heard of him. And another person of whom you have most definitely heard named Cotton Mather. Probably the most famous person in the American colonies at the moment of this event. Okay. In the early afternoon of July 12, 1726, William Fly ascended Boston's gallows to be hanged for piracy. His body was nimble in manner like a sailor going aloft. His rope roughened hands carried a nosegay of flowers. His weather beaten face had a smiling aspect. He showed no guilt, no shame, and no contrition. And indeed, as Cotton Mather noted, he looked about him unconcerned. But once he stood on the gallows, he became concerned, but not in the way anyone might have expected. His demeanor quickened, and he immediately took charge of the stage of death. He threw the hanging rope over the beam, made it fast, and then carefully inspected the noose that would go around his neck. He soon turned to the hangman in disappointment and reproached him for not understanding his trade. The hangman had not tied a proper hangman's noose. But William Fly, who like all good sailors, knew the art of tying knots, took mercy on the novice. And right there in front of the astonished multitude, he retied the knot that would go around his neck. He informed the hangman and the crowd that he was not afraid to die and that he had wronged no man. Mather explained that he was determined to die a brave fellow. Well, I'm sure all of you know that hangings in the 18th century were big public events. I mean, very nearly the whole town of Boston would come out for something like this. Very big event. And there was a, a protocol to this ritual. The condemned were supposed to stand on the gallows and say certain things. They were supposed to teach lessons about what had brought them to this terrible end. And when the time came for last words, Cotton Mather 
wanted William Fly and three other pirates to, as he would have put it, become preachers, meaning to impart these lessons to the, the assembled multitude. Well, three of the pirates did. They were probably hoping for a last-minute part because it was not uncommon in this day that the rope might be around your neck and the royal hand of mercy would be extended. So they played the part that was expected of them. They warned everyone in the crowd to obey their parents, to obey their superiors, not to curse, not to drink, not to visit the house of the harlot, and not to profane the Lord's day. They acknowledge the justice of the proceedings against them, and they thanked the ministers, like Cotton Mather, for their spiritual assistance. That's the first three. Then it was William Fly's turn. William Fly did not ask for forgiveness. He did not praise the authorities, and he did not affirm the values of Christianity as he was supposed to do, but he did issue a warning. Now these are his last words. We have them. His last words were that, quote, all masters of vessels, and remember, this is a crowd full of seafaring people. Lots of them ship captains, right? So he wants to say directly to the ship captains, all masters of vessels might take warning by the fate of the captain, meaning Captain Green, that he had murdered. And to pay sailors their wages when due, and to treat them better, saying, that their barbarity to them made so many turn pirates. Those are his last words. He went literally out of this world protesting the conditions of work at sea. He was launched into eternity with the brash threat of mutiny on his lips. Now, William Fly died on his own terms. Cotton Mather thought he detected a slight tremor in his hand and his knees as he spoke, but nonetheless, he died on his own terms. He was mistaken in thinking that he would have the last word because the magistrates and ministers of Boston had reserved for themselves the last line of the drama. If Fly would not warn people in the ways they deemed proper, they would do it themselves, and in so doing, they would answer his threat. After the execution, they hanged Fly's body in chains at the entrance of Boston Harbor, quote, as a spectacle for the warning of others, especially seafaring men, end quote. William Fly is an unusual figure in one sense. Unusual in that as a pirate, we have a fairly elaborate record of what he thought. Most pirates we don't know. They didn't leave documents of their own. They were poor. But William Fly caused such a ruckus in the town of Boston that everybody wrote about him. The newspapers wrote about him. Mather wrote about him. Benjamin Coleman wrote about him. Foreign correspondents wrote, wrote about him. And so we can get a sense of what he thought. You see, Cotton Mather actually took this whole thing personally. He vowed that he was going to save William Fly's soul. He was going to bring him to salvation. So he had several special meetings with him. Spiritual counseling. 
he got nowhere. But he did write down some things that William Fly said. Let me read you one more thing. Cotton Mather is meeting with Fly and he's trying to encourage him to repent and save his soul. Fly, one of these meetings, explodes in anger. He says, I shan't own myself guilty of any murder. Our captain and his mate treated us barbarously. We, poor men, can't have justice done us. There is nothing said to our commanders. Let them never so much abuse us and use us like dogs. But the poor sailors, and you can hear the, the rage mounting, and at that point, Mather cuts it off. I guess he couldn't bear to hear any more. But William Fly had his say, and everything he said was about the horrid conditions for the common sailor on board the ships of his time. Well, one of the things that I love about this history of piracy in this period is that not only is this a vivid and dramatic story, it also has some unexpected outcomes. And one of the most fabulous unexpected outcomes is that even though Cotton Mather couldn't convince William Fly of anything, it turns out that William Fly did convince Cotton Mather. You might say that William Fly actually won the debate with Cotton Mather. Do you know how we know? Because after the hanging, as was customary in Boston, the city's leading minister gave what was called an execution sermon. And like every other word that came out of Cotton Mather's mouth, it was published. And guess what he said? One of the things he said, he turned to the ship captains in the crowd, and here's what he said. He told them in no uncertain terms that they must hereafter avoid being, and I quote, too like the devil in their barbarous usage of the men that are under them and lay them under temptations to do desperate things, end quote. Cotton Mather repeated almost word for word what William Fly had said to him. And even though Cotton Mather had a very different view of the world, he recognized the justice of at least this one thing that William Fly said. And he used it to admonish the ship captains. He says, you're behaving like the devil, and you're treating your men in a barbarous way. Well, folks, I, I wanted to start with this event because I think herein lies one of the main arguments of this book. I started working on this book, uh, I hate to remember, in 1976. I never intended to write it, by the way, but I did research on pirates. I published an essay, and in the 20 years after, the phone just wouldn't stop ringing. Journalists, filmmakers, playwrights, novelists, just pirate enthusiasts. Everybody wanted to talk about pirates. I guess you could say I was a slow learner. I finally figured out I really should write a book about the subject. Uh, but in that early research, and then in lots of research that I've done over the 20 odd years since, what I learned is that pirates were basically just poor common sailors in this period. Now, I'm talking about the early 18th century. There's a very long history of piracy. But in the early 18th century, the golden age of piracy, it's sort of 1650 to 1730, and there are three different generations. You've got the Buccaneers and Henry Morgan. You've got the 1690s pirates and William Kidd. And you've got this group, my group. I claim them. From the 17-teens and 1720s, and this is the group that produced most of the images that we now have of pirates. 
This is the image of, this is the, the generation of the Jolly Roger, the black flag with the skull and the crossbones. Uh, this is the generation of Blackbeard, the fearsome pirate, Edward Teach. When we think of pirates, this is the group we think of. And what I found is that they were just these poor, common, working sailors. They were not, as you saw in those wonderful Errol Flynn movies, the son of an aristocrat who ran away to sea to kind of win his fortune. They were just poor, ordinary, working sailors. Well, it turns out this is a key to understanding what they were doing. Why did they do it? What did they think they were doing? What did piracy mean to them? This is what you might call people's history or history from the bottom up. What did they think it was all about? Well, it turns out that what they thought it was all about is much more interesting than the Hollywood myth that we get, even in its latest incarnation of Pirates of the Caribbean. It turns out there were many fairly complex reasons why people turned pirate. Greed, which is a fairly simple reason, was certainly one of them. But it turns out there's a much more complex social rationale, and much of it was expressed by William Fly. The conditions of life aboard the ships of that day. Now, who were they? They were poor working sailors. Many of them were people of African descent. This, I think, is largely unknown. Uh, I was myself fairly astonished by what a large percentage of people on most every ship were either African or African American. There's an instance recounted in the book in which a, a royal official from St. Kitts is riding home to his superiors in London saying, we've got a real problem with rebellious slaves. And then he recounted a very revealing instance. It turns out they also had a problem with pirates nearby, and there was a pirate ship anchored not far offshore, and one day uh, a sizable group of rebellious slaves went down to the harbor, stole a couple of boats, rowed out to the pirate ship, and were welcomed aboard. And why not? What did pirates want in fellow pirates? They wanted somebody who would be completely committed to what they were doing. A runaway slave could be as completely committed as anybody you can imagine. So lots of pirates were of African descent. And of course, there were women pirates. Did you know? Women pirates? I only found four of them. But two of the four, Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, were very, very famous people in their own day. Very rugged pirates. They dressed as men and went to sea. I'll give you one story briefly about each of them. Mary Reed had fought as a soldier in the War of Spanish Succession. So she was, I mean, this cross-dressing was nothing new to her. She was on her way to the West Indies in a vessel when her ship was taken by pirates, and she joined up. She said, I'll join up with those, these characters. Turns out she got aboard a pirate ship, captained by a man named Calico Jack Rackham. And you have to admit, they had great names. And she fell in love with another pirate, a male pirate on board. And she allowed him to discover her secret. But then one day, a terrible thing happened. Her lover got into a spat with another pirate, a big, rugged character. And that guy challenged... Mary Reed's sweetheart to a duel. Pirates would never allow fighting to take place on board the ship. They would take it off the ship and people would fight a duel. Well, Mary Reed was beside herself because she was absolutely sure that this man was going to kill her sweetheart. So what to do? She thought about it. She thought about it. Finally, she picked a fight with the same rugged pirate, challenged him to a duel, Schedule the duel conveniently one hour before the one to take place involved with her lover, and she promptly killed the man on the spot. And Bonnie was no less dramatic a figure. And Bonnie was, uh, she ran away, dressed as a man, went to sea. She fell in love with Calico Jack Rackham. 
There's a great story about her in that one day, well, uh, the Jamaican authorities actually sent an armed vessel after Calico Jack. They knew they were in the area and uh, sort of foggy conditions. The ship actually got very near to Calico Jack's vessel before they knew it. And then suddenly there was the, the other ship. Calico Jack and most of the crew were terrified and they ran down into the hold of the ship to hide. And Ann Bonney and Mary Reed and one male pirate stayed up on the deck to fire the cannon to try to repel the attacker. They failed. They were all captured and taken into Jamaica, all sentenced to be hanged. Ann Bonney and Mary Reed, it turns out, were, po were pregnant and could not be hanged under English law. So the time comes when Calico Jack is standing on the gallows with a rope around his neck. And he looks at Anne imploringly, and somebody wrote down Anne's response. Anne looked at him and said, Jack, don't look at me like that, because if you had fought like a man, you wouldn't now be hanged like a dog. And if this isn't an origin, a grand origin of modern feminism, I don't know what is. So these are tough characters, and like I say, very famous in their own day very famous in their own day. So pirates are, are actually much more interesting in terms of their social composition than we knew. They're also much more interesting in terms of how they ran their ships. And this, I find, is one of the most important things about them. Pirates ran their ships in the idiom of democracy. Now, you've got to think and pause and think about that for a minute. This is a period, folks, when poor people have no democratic rights whatsoever. And ship captains of the day, whether in the merchant service or the Royal Navy, have nearly unchecked authority to do whatever they want to a sailor, including literally beating them to death with a cat of nine tails. I have read some grisly legal records in which this was a, an all too common outcome. So. What did pirates do when they organized their own ship? This is actually a very important question for me because I wanted to know, did they just reproduce what they had known in the other lines of work? They did something completely different. They elected their captains. They also elected another uh, officer called the quartermaster. And the quartermaster had one main job to keep an eye on that captain and make sure he doesn't abuse his authority. And if a captain did abuse his authority, he'd be busted back. And if he abused it in a major way, they might kill him. And that also happened. So, from a reality in which the captain has unchecked authority to a situation where the captain is democratically elected and constrained in a dozen different ways. From a situation where people have very poor food, if any food at all, to a situation where pirates are chronically feasting. They love feasts and parties. Everybody comments on this. The pirates were always merry. That's the word that they used. And you know what was one of the favorite slogans of the pirates? I think it's very revealing. A merry life and a short one. Well, that was the reality on board the ships of the day, a short life. And pirates' attitude was, let us live while we can. A reality where sailors are frequently built of their wages. Pirates not only plunder, they divide up their plunder very equally. People are shocked by that. A captain in the Royal Navy may make... 40, 50, 100 times as much as the common sailor. You know how much more a captain made than the lowest sailor on the pirate ship? That lowest sailor would get one share, the captain would get a share and a half, maybe two. Well, this is brilliant because it's a recruiting mechanism. The word gets around among common sailors about how pirates do things. And so therefore, when they capture a prize vessel, lots of people join up. Now, one example about the way in which pirates use their experience as common sailors as they captured their prey 
Most people think that when a prize vessel was taken, the pirates would fall to plundering and it would be sort of this mad, crazy scene. That's actually not what they did. What they would do instead was to call all the sailors up on ship, on deck, and situate the captain over to the side, and the pirate quartermaster, who would always be the head of any boarding party, and you know, this elected official, the most trusted man on the ship, by the way, he would address each of the assembled sailors, and he would say, how does your captain treat you? Or what do you say? What is your ca- how does your captain feed you properly? Does your captain cheat you out of your wages? And if they start answering, yes, he does, that captain was in a lot of trouble. Because these sailors, had, these pirates had experienced that. And they were full of anger about it, just like William Fly. So if a crew complained against their captain, that captain would be tied up to the mast and whipped in exactly the same place where he had whipped the members of his crew, in their view, unfairly. So the pirate acts the part of the avenger on behalf of the common sailor. But it also worked the other way. If these assembled sailors say, our captain is an honest man, and that was the phrase they used, an honest man, the pirates would give him his ship back. They might even give him extra money. There's one instance where they say, take the money back to London, and show the merchants what happens when a captain treats his crew well. So there's this sense that they are acting on behalf of the common sailor. Well, again, it's another brilliant recruiting ploy. Because after they enact this ritual, the pirate quartermaster would turn to the crew and say, okay, who's with us? Well, if you had just complained against your captain and gotten him whipped, you better go with them. Right? You better go with those guys. So they, they, they were smart about this. They recruited. But there is this social side to all this. And I think this is really critical. Well, to conclude, the, uh, the conclusion of this book is called Blood and Gold. It talks about the way in which in the final years of the golden age of piracy, the war turned savage. The authorities are executing more and more people, and the decreasing number of pirates who are left at sea are becoming themselves more violent, more cruel, killing more ship captains. It becomes a bloodletting. It's a, it's a bloody situation, full of death. And I conclude that that violence is one of the things that really fascinates us about pirates. But I also conclude that what really captivates us is something else. And I think anybody who writes about pirates has got to answer one question. Why are we so fascinated with these characters? Because, believe me folks, over the years, when I tell anybody that I'm studying pirates, rather than kind of the dulling of the eyes of most such academic discussions, their eyes brighten and I can see that there are childhood memories at stake. Right? Why do we, why are we so fascinated? Well, here's my answer. We're fascinated by the violence, but the blood does not hide the gold. We love pirates most of all because they were rebels. They challenged in one way or another the conventions of class, race, gender, and nation. They were poor and in low circumstances but they expressed high ideals. Shadowed by the Grim Reaper, they stole his symbolism and they laughed in his face. Pirates opposed the high and mighty of their day and by their actions they became the villains of all nations. They relished the role, even though their phrase, a merry life and a short one, contained a cruel contradiction. The more that pirates built and enjoyed their merry, autonomous existence, the more determined the authorities grew to destroy them. These outlaws led audacious, rebellious lives, 
and we should remember them as long as there are powerful people and oppressive circumstances to be resisted. I think that's why we love pirates most of all. The example of their rebelliousness and living the freest of lives imaginable. Thank you very much. There are always questions about pirates, good questions about pirates. May I just answer what I know will be two questions up front. I should have said something about this before. These are kind of heartbreaking truths. First of all, pirates didn't make people walk the plank. Although they could be very creative in their tortures, that was not one of them. And then secondly, and this is really terrible, pirates didn't bury their treasure. You know, they didn't believe in deferred gratification of any kind. And the idea of burying treasure is kind of a 19th century invention whereby savings was becoming, you know, sort of a thing that the lower orders were supposed to do, not pirates. Anyway, questions? Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, uh, the, I will repeat the question. The question is about John Phillips. This is a question asked by a knowledgeable person who knows specifically about the captaincy of John Phillips. Yes, I do write about him a bit, and I have actually a fair amount of additional material that uh, is not in the book. So if, if you'd like to know more, we could communicate about that. John Phillips was a, a pretty rugged character who was done in by a mutiny on board his own pirate ship because he made a terrible mistake. He forced some people off of merchant ships to sail on his own ship. That was never a good idea because those people were not really pirates. And lo and behold, he was uh, in this mutiny. Uh, John Phillips, I'm pretty sure, was beheaded. Someone took an ax to him and beheaded him. His crew was actually brought, I think, into uh, was, was it Boston or maybe Newport? And several, Boston, in fact, I think they were, several of them were hanged here. Uh, but as I recall, John Phillips had a background in the fishing industry, which is a very rugged line of work. Uh, he was uh, apparently quite a colorful figure, uh, but I'm inclined to think he was not the most effective of pirate captains. You can always tell who the really effective captains are because they don't have to force anybody to join them. Yes? How does a pirate ship become a pirate ship? There are basically two ways. A small but important number of people created a pirate ship through mutiny. There would be, there are probably no 15, 18 examples of a small group of people on board a ship who are really angry about their treatment. And so they decide they're going to rise up and seize the ship. William Fly was one who did. And he killed the captain in the mutiny. Those people would then have a choice. Either you could set up as pirates, and quite a few did, or you could simply take the ship somewhere it was not intended to go and try to escape. In this period, in this period of the 17 teens and 20s, a lot of people decided they wanted to stitch up the black flag and sail as pirates. That, however, was not the most common way that a pirate ship was created because, as you can imagine, these things that I've said about how pirates recruited, a lot of royal officials are riding back to London and saying, you know, when they capture a ship, a significant part of the crew always joins up. Well, imagine then how the pirate ships get more and more overcrowded. When they get to a certain point, when they capture a merchant vessel, they turn that into a pirate ship and put half their crew on board, and so now you've got two pirate ships. And when they gather more, then you've got four pirate ships. So it's this kind of, it's an amoeba-like splitting, but it's also a fascinating way in which they're 
democratic and egalitarian culture was reproduced because the person who would almost always be the captain on a newly set up ship would be the quartermaster. And then they would elect a new quartermaster to keep an eye on him. Now, not everybody could be a, a pirate captain because you needed to know the principles of navigation. And there were some people who simply didn't know them. Uh, but there were enough people around who did that pirates never wanted for captains. But I'd say that probably 80% uh, of people became pirates in this somewhat less romantic way of joining up through a prize vessel that was captured. Yes. Yes, I do. In, in this period, actually the period that I'm writing about is only about 10 years long. 1716, 15, 17, 15, 17, 16. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was how many pirates were there? In, uh, in this generation, there were probably about 4,000 of them, I'm guessing. That's my best estimate. 4,000, maybe a few more. Uh, and that doesn't sound like a huge number, but when you imagine or realize that the British Royal Navy which was the most powerful navy of the day during peacetime had 10 or 12,000 people in it. They were a pretty formidable force. So, so there were 4,000. In the course of my research over all these years, I have learned the names of 778 of them. So I've got, I've, I've got almost a quarter of them, 20% say. And I know different things about different ones. I know the working background of about 200 of them. They were almost all sailors, merchant sailors. Uh, follow up. Yes. Question is, when they become pirates, do they ever make it back to shore? In this period, the government, the British government especially, plays a leading role, but France and Spain and Portugal also play their part. They execute as many of these people as they can. In the earlier periods, they were actually very tolerant of piracy because the buccaneers were almost always attacking the territories of Spain. And the English royalty liked that idea, right? So it was actually a source of wealth to England. But in this period, you've got English pirates attacking English ships, and that had to result in mass hanging. So those who escaped, and it's hard to know how many did, could only do so if they changed their names and really tried to keep everything they had done as pirates a secret because the government would hunt people down. But there, but there is one, just one quick passage I want to read. One of the things I like most about this book, I was able to reconstruct a sort of biography of a rank and file pirate named Walter Kennedy. And uh, one of the reasons why was because when he was about to be hanged, someone who was going to write one of these, you know, the dying thoughts of the pirate Walter Kennedy went into his jail cell and interviewed him. And the thing that I thought was so interesting about this, he said, the person wrote, Walter Kennedy took a particular delight in relating what had happened to him in his piratical expeditions, even after they had brought him to misery and confinement. So here was a guy who loved telling the stories of piracy so much, he kept telling them even though it was going to get him killed in the end, and he was in fact hanged. So these stories would circulate, but you had to be very careful. Yes, sir, back here. The question was, is there a period when the American government supported pirates? Uh, I'd say that indirectly, yes, in the sense that there were many royal officials who cooperated with pirates in order to get a share of their booty. Governor Fletcher from New York did it. Governor Eden from North Carolina did it. This, of course, made the king very angry because he felt like he wasn't getting his proper share. So he did things to sort of put an end to that. But in this period, there is no governmental support of any kind for these people. And all governments, whether in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Port Royal, Jamaica, London, they are out to kill as many of these folks as they can. And they do. Yes. 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 The question was uh, about privateering. Does it evolve from this? 
I'm sure many of you know, privateering is essentially a legal form of piracy in the sense that during wartime, a private citizen or a group of investors with a ship, a private man of war, would go to the king or the king's representative and say, we'd like a commission so that we may attack his majesty's enemies during wartime. And the king would say, here's your commission, give me 10%. But the problem was, when the wars were over, you suddenly had huge numbers of men from the Royal Navy and huge numbers of privateers who couldn't find any jobs. And so when the War of Spanish Succession ends, everybody knows there's going to be a major outburst of piracy. I've got royal officials riding back to London, oh my God, these privateers are everywhere, we know they're going to go out as pirates, and lo and behold, they do. So there is a, an interesting economic cause of all this. The maritime labor market gets flooded and thousands of people turn to piracy. There's no other employment for them. So it's not hard to understand why they did it. Yes. Well, in the early period, Henry Morgan, who led these swaggering buccaneering attacks on all of the ports of New Spain, became Sir Henry Morgan and he became the Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica. But by the time you get to this period, nobody is going to be allowed that option because they were the enemies of the British state. But some do retire, although not in the sense that we might think. What pirates tended to do was drop out of society, and frequently they did so by joining and intermixing with native societies in various parts of the world. For example, in Madagascar, in West Africa, in the Caribbean, and in Central America, pirates joined indigenous tribal groups. It's fascinating. And everybody says and they, they created a sort of something different. But many of these groups were quite inclusive, especially if they thought the pirates had something useful to them as did the people in uh, present-day Sierra Leone called the Kru, uh, an African ethnic group. They were a seafaring people, and they incorporated quite a few pirates into their midst. And so that's how some of the pirates who got away managed to survive. They had to literally move into a completely different sort of society than the one they had come from. Yes? Yes. Did they have safe havens and did they work together in multiple ships? They did have safe havens, but the problem is that the authorities recognized how the safe havens were a big part of the problem. So in 1721, they passed a law saying that if you cooperated with pirates in any way, we'll hang you too. This tended to make their safe havens considerably less safe. The second question, did they work together? Yes, they did. They, there's, a, there's a fascinating instance of one group of pirates being at anchor, it was in West Africa, and they see another vessel coming, and so they start preparing to fight. They assume that it's a, either a man of war or a merchant ship or someone coming after them. Well, the approaching ship runs up the Jolly Roger, whereupon the people on the other pirate ship start screaming and clapping and cheering, and so they come together for a giant party. They had not known each other before, but they sailed under the same flag. So there was definitely a consciousness of being on the same side against all those people who sailed under the national flags. The pirate flag is kind of a, an anti-national flag. It's the flag of a gang of outlaws who say, yeah, we don't like these nations of the world. In fact, they would joke about it. These pirates were very funny. Of course, it was all gallows humor. But somebody would say, well, what's your nation? They'd say, ah, we sold our nation. We don't have a nation. We come from the seas. Yes, Marty. Well, this is actually important because in the early 19th century, the United States plays an important role in battle, battling a different group of pirates in the Mediterranean, the, the Barbary pirates, as they were called. And this is probably one of their greatest early successes. The Barbary pirates had plagued European and American commerce for centuries, and the Americans played a role in basically eliminating them. So I'd say that uh, most all navies 
do prove their, their worth, their mettle, by battling pirates. And in fact, uh, the decisive naval engagement against the crew of Bartholomew Roberts, who was the overwhelmingly most famous and successful pirate of my era, captured 400 ships. His defeat by the Royal Navy was really the turning point. So again, the naval action brought great credit. Uh, the captain, Shalner Ogle, was knighted for having defeated the pirates. Most, I shouldn't say most, many naval commanders were just frankly afraid of them. <laughs> That's a very good question, and it's kind of a trick question, isn't it? The question was, is the American Navy then therefore based in an anti-democratic action? Well, I'd say yes and no. And the, the no part of it would be that a lot of the people who were in the American Navy were themselves influenced by the tradition of maritime radicalism that pirates expressed. And it's fascinating to me to see things like there's, there's one guy who is captured in Bartholomew Roberts' crew in 1722, and when it's time for him to be hanged, he comes up and, you know what his defense is? He said, I was a member of the Royal Navy who captured and killed Blackbeard. I guess he changed his mind. He changed his mind and became a pirate himself later. So these things can work on both sides. How, how are we doing for time, Michelle? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 What I tell them is different from what I tell you. What I tell them is that pirates bury treasure all the time and I'm just not going to tell them where it is. Yes, one last one. This is a, is a very good question. The, the crew sizes on the pirate ships were, of course, much larger than on a comparable merchant ship. Let's say a, a, a merchant ship of 200 tons, which would have been a pretty good ship, would have had 16 to 18 working hands. The same pirate ship would have had about 80 on board which means they didn't have to work very hard. And they liked it like that, but they were shockingly egalitarian in all of their intra-group relations on the ship. In fact, when a merchant captain is captured by pirates, one of the things they very frequently say, it's shocking how disrespectful they are to their own captain. They say, the captain doesn't even allow, isn't even allowed his own cabin. Any sailor can come in and sit down and eat with the captain anytime he wants. So they've kind of leveled that whole tradition of hierarchy. Now they are, now, now think, think about it folks. How do you govern or rule 80 people who are armed to the teeth? You would really better be very careful. Yeah.